get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. So there you have it. A biblical commandment for widows to get remarried, especially younger ones. Um, we also have other passages where it says that widows are free from the law when the husband dies and can marry, i.e. remarry, whomever she pleases, as it is the case in Romans 7, 2-3 and 1 Corinthians 7, 39. Again, back to the remarriage uh, or the marriage chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 39. Or 7, 39. It's obvious the same principle here applies to the man, even while the use of the masculine pronoun uh, is not to be confused with the feminine in this passage. So obviously if a wife dies, the marital bound is also severed and the husband is free to remarry. Um, so um, the certainly the man who has been married uh, twice, even though the widow or even though his wife has died, is absolutely above reproach uh, based on the requirements uh, listed in the following passage where uh, 1 Timothy 3.12 states, Deacons or overseers must be the husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. So this goes without saying that, uh, that it would apply to the man as well. And we notice in the above passage that there is evidence that the practice of polygamy is not acceptable, nor above reproach in the New Testament church. Um, a man should not be bound to multiple wives uh, any more than Adam should have had uh, his wife Eve plus a Betty and so forth. Um, one wife is abundantly sufficient for a man. Um, and deviating away from that design of God um, is therefore subject to turmoil and we can cite example after example in scripture where polygamous relationships um, reaped havoc on the world and generations as well as nations even unto this day. Understand that man is called to a nuclear monogamous family. Okay. And included in the marriage chapter as we've been going through in chapter uh, 7 is the fact that a wife is bound as long as her husband lives. Remember that word bound that we talked about in the last sessions. Verse 39a says that the wife is bound as long as her husband lives. Period. That's just how it is. Not long as they're married before a divorce, as long as they live. But if her husband is dead... She is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is uh, happier if she remains as she is. There he is again advocating for celibacy. And I think that I also have the spirit of God. So here he says that, you know, widowhood has its challenges as well. Like just because you've been, um, you're going to get remarried and you're, you're, uh, not bound to the wife that has died or the husband has died. It's still a challenge, right? You'll be happier if you remain as you are, if you remain celibate. Um, uh, so there's a warning there that it's not um, in, uh, it's not going to be some thing that doesn't have any trouble just because you've, uh, you've been widowed or, uh, and so forth. So the question is, why didn't those verses, why didn't verse 39 say, that the widow is not under bondage in such cases, if that's how we interpret verse 15, right? So, uh, you know, why does it not say uh, bondage or use that word? This also affirms the only one that can be uh, free from a marital bound is by death. It's crystal clear. The only ones that can be free to remarry after being married is if your spouse is dead period okay uh, Romans 7 2 3 another subject on this issue for the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth 
again. Okay, But if the husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So then while her husband liveth, here we go, a divorce situation, a separation situation. Verse 3. If she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So can you recognize that marriage? If she be married, if you're, if you're going to act like you're married to another man, you're not a wife, you're an adulteress. That is your title. I'm not saying that. That's what Romans 7 verses 3 says. Okay, But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So there you have it, right? And some widows are like that. People are like, whoa, she's married to someone else. Paul says right there, you are free from that law of your first husband, okay? Because he is gone. He is dead, okay? So here the... Uh, God's word has used another example of the inviolable marriage bound um, to describe and confirm once again how the legal, legal dedication of marriage cannot be undone while the spouse is alive. There is no betrothal exemption clause to here to grasp at. We need to get this, okay? We need to get it once and for all. We're done with this, okay? We're done with these false divorce exemption loopholes to appeal to the world or to, to appeal to outsiders or to appeal to people that have gone through it and are living in that condition right now and they don't want to be ashamed or put to shame because of this. It is what it is under any condition, period. Okay. Then he goes on to verse 4 to say that we are dead to the law and now can be married in that sense to the Lord Jesus as another metaphor as Christ as the bride of Christ. And this is what we're talking about. Christ loves his bride and he gave himself for it. Or for her. He gave himself for her and died for her. And likewise, a husband should be uh, do the same thing. So um, some may say, you know, someone, a, a younger woman especially who has been abandoned, say, departed by an unbelieving husband, may be in a desperate state. But so are widows. So why are there no commandments for the woman, especially the younger women that has been departed by a husband, to get remarried? Right? That's because it's simply not within the bounds. It's a transgressing the design and law and, and uh, order of God and would be adultery, as the scripture says. The horrific sin of a perpetual sin of adultery. This is what we don't want to do. There is no changing that. The marriage bound is for life. There is no exception. Okay? And when we're talking about marriage bounds, we're talking about legitimate marriage bounds. Um, it perhaps is innumerable how many apparent marriages out there are not marriages at all, but um, adulterated uh, relationship situations that they have gone into the pretense of calling it marriage when it actually is not. And as we move along from that, okay, we conclude that only the death of a spouse uh, can mean that you can get remarried and not be in adultery. But now we will shift into kind of more of uh, circumstantial support points that will try to show us that um, the action to divorce and remarry is not at all in line with the conduct of a Christian uh, and the, um, the biblical order that we are commanded to live by. And the question is, shall the offended, so the spouse that has been cheated on, the innocent party that we're talking about, shall they take vengeance? Okay. Sometimes scripture seems unfair, doesn't it? And we want to take, we want to step in and take justice and take matters into our own hands, don't we? If someone offends, we want to offend them back. If we're honest, this is sinful man's mentality. 
the questions are asked. Why does the victim of adultery have to suffer even more and stay single and all alone? Poor person. This is as she has had to see her husband move on with a new woman with a broken heart. Does she not need a protector and a provider, perhaps? We would love to make an excuse for them to trade up, wouldn't we? This is a very common narrative and political talking point in the study today, especially among helpers of those divorced. But it doesn't matter how we may feel. What matters is, is what the Bible says. That is what we need to come back to. The reasons go on. Why should the one who have been left and been cheated on be left destitute and remain otherwise sexually deprived and unfulfilled? Why can't he or she get justice and a sense of uh, happiness with a new fresh partner who would not or hopefully likely not um, repeat such a sin? Christians want retribution. We want to fix things as we judge and act out, okay? They want another chance. On this and to start a new happy family but you get one chance at marriage okay you don't get multiple chances believers should understand it and this and as I pointed out many unbelievers even understand this point that um, you get one chance at marriage and family so this kind of thought pattern that we have is the sin nature deeply rooted in us the indoctrination would any suggest an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? So adultery for adultery, right? We are told to do what? The Lord Jesus raised the bar. Turn the other cheek. We are not to do so, even if the other one has done so in vain. Believers are called to deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow the Lord. So we're never, ever, as believers, to take vengeance, make war with, or try to get even with an offending spouse, no matter how right it may seem to us to do that. Okay. In modern 21st century democracy that we live in today, man can basically do as he pleases concerning marriage and be within the worldly laws. We don't need to exhaust demoralizing terms of marriage, including rights of same-sex couples, and so forth and so on. They get government certified marriage certificates as well. The very term marriage in these plights is an oxymoron, okay? Marriage is, we know it is between one man and one woman. So again, how much of this stuff is influencing Christians? It's taking a toll, right? It's demoralizing you. It's demoralizing us. Marital conflicts are raw, okay? There is no situation, perhaps in life, human life as we can know it, than the sorest, harshest issues of remarriage and divorce. This is true with everyone um, that are involved with it. Um, legalities, political issues, uh, legal legalities. Um, there are domestic calls out for police which resemble extremely contentious, dangerous, and even combative situations at times as separated couples act out as they so often do. Um, for our police and protective service, these are some of the most loathed and risky, for safety reasons, emotional dramas to attend. And uh, safety of the children uh, is always top priority. Um, as emotions flare and people act out as their whole lives and their security and their finances unravel before their very eyes. So can we see biblically what the calling of peace was? Keep the peace, remember? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. But God has called us to peace. We're not to go there. God has called us to peace. And then we, we talk a bit about um, who shall the divorced woman uh, remarry. Whoever marries a divorced woman shall commit adultery. What brother is going to want to marry a divorced woman uh, and be risk being um, in adultery or risk the wrath of a jealous man who um, wants to act out 
and who is still alive and well and has interests with that woman and her estate and uh, the children perhaps. So getting into a relationship with this is seems to be the action and the way of a proverbial textbook foo. So keep the peace. Therefore, the believer is not under bondage or enslavement. Okay? Do not employ any aggressive tactics to get them to stay. Don't try to get access and allies and rescuers to get in and assist. Okay? These emotional dramas involving third parties can, uh, and children can uh, just add to the turmoil. Okay? The imagination is the limit to what an assembly of persons could do to try to coerce and force someone to stay in the relationship or what have you. Um, this is especially um, imaginable in medieval times of history, right? Where they could, uh, where such action and dispute among families could start a civil war and bloodshed between families or clans. Okay, there's so much bitterness and raw emotion to this thing. So our priority is to keep the peace. All right. And this is um, where we go to lead up to our next study and segment on keeping the peace. Thank you for staying with us. And we'll look at that uh, verse 15, part B of chapter 7, 1 Corinthians.